real quick? Um, sure. I'm Hannah Pemberton. I work at Canine Country Academy, um, and I do a lot of sports with my dog, Maple, which is that way. Um, <laughs> Hiding from us. <laughs> and we're trying, we're going to try out bike touring, and hopefully she doesn't kill me. <laughs> yes, that's the goal. That is the goal. Yeah. And that requires a little bit of prep ahead of time. Um, so for any of you who are joining us that uh, might not know what we're talking about today, uh, we are talking about the sport of dryland mushing. There are lots of different ways you can do it. You can run and then it's called canacross. Hannah is going to be doing it on a bike. So her dog will be out in front of the bike pulling as she pedals. And you can do this on sidewalks. You know, ideally we focus on soft trails so that the surface is a little bit easier on them. So um, we are going to get started first with a little bit of equipment. So besides a bike and a helmet for the person, you are going to need um, a few pieces of equipment for your dog. So one is going to be an appropriate harness. There are harnesses that are designed specifically for this sport. Um, and you do want to make sure that you have one of those because fit is really important. We do want to make sure that it fits appropriately to whatever style you end up getting, whether you get a halfback or a distance harness, or you get a full back or an X back harness. Fit is really important. We want to make sure that the dog can take lots of big deep breaths in and out and that that's not restricted. We also want to make sure that um, they have full range of motion in their legs. So appropriate fit harness is gonna be the number one thing you need. Uh, you also will need some sort of bungee line for your dog. And it's again, a, a line or a leash lead that is designed specifically for the sport that has a little bit of bungee in it. So if your dog pulls really hard or jerks off to the side, it, it provides some shock. <laughs> I'm sorry, Maple, we're gonna work in a minute. <laughs> um, that bungee provides a little bit of shock absorption to help make the ride smoother for you and easier on your dog. And then lastly, for bike joring, you are going to need some sort of antenna to help keep your line elevated so that it doesn't get stuck in your front wheel. So those are gonna be the pieces of equipment that you need. I'm happy to, after this, provide some links to a few vendors if you guys need some assistance finding equipment. Um, so Hannah, we are gonna get started today from the very beginning, which is teaching our dogs how to put pressure on the leash, on cue, and with enough reinforcement so that our dog knows that pressure on the leash is good. So a lot of us pet people have done a lot of loose leash walking, teaching our dogs to walk either next to us or on a loose leash without pressure. So it can be confusing a little bit when we then ask them to put pressure on the lead. So as you guys can see, I'm gonna make myself small here and I'm gonna make Hannah's screen big so that you can see I think I may have lost you. Can you hear me, Hannah? I can hear you now. I, you, yeah. You couldn't hear me before? No. Okay. So um, then we'll probably have to keep me in the stream in order to keep the uh, sound going. But um, what I was saying is that we've got that bungee line hooked up to her pillar um, so that she has... Uh, something to keep her dog tethered. So you can do this indoors. You can also do this outdoors if you wanted to tether your dog to uh, a tree. We just need some kind of anchor in the back so that we can lure our dogs forward and reward them for pressure on the leash. Uh, Hannah, do you have your clicker and your treats ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So let's go ahead and hook her up to her harness on that bungee line. All right, and what we're gonna do, we're gonna get started using a little bit of luring. I want you to lure her forward so that she feels just a little bit of pressure on her line, and then you're gonna click and treat. Nice, and when you do this, Hannah, you can even toss a treat backwards to get her then to release the pressure. Nice, so then we're setting you up for another repetition of learning to put that pressure onto that line. Really nice. So we're just using a little piece of food in front of the dog's nose to pull her forward. And the moment there's pressure on that line, Hannah is clicking and delivering a treat. 
And we're tossing that treat backwards behind her because then she has to release the pressure on the leech, which then sets her up for another repetition of putting pressure on the line. So Hannah, I'm gonna let you practice a few repetitions of that and I'm gonna make the screen big so that they can see you, okay? okay. Now you can tell that Maple is still just a little bit hesitant about it. She's not really gung ho, you know, she's not reaching the end of the line and really, really leaning into it. So with each repetition that she's successful, Hannah could ask her for just a little bit more pressure. So she would just use that treat to lure her just a little bit further and click when she's really leaning into that harness. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> must, must remove tangles. Nice. So Hannah, let's see if we can start luring her just a tad further forward so that we're really getting pressure on that line. Hey Hannah, do you have the ability to tie that line a little bit higher up on that pillar? Yeah. Why don't we do that so that it's a little bit closer to the elevation that it's going to be on the bike and then it won't be touching her back and making her kind of worried about it. Mm, I don't know if it'll stay up here. Well, it's bungee, isn't it? So I can just sort of... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it should stay up. Okay. Here. And you can, you're welcome to lure her in a variety of directions. It does not always need to be the same direction. And that might help kind of vary it and make it a little bit more interesting for her too. Nice. That was great timing on that click. The moment you, she leaned forward into that harness, you clicked and captured it. All right, so Hannah, let's give her a break for just a second and let's talk about what we're doing here. And you can unhook her, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Really nice, quick break. So when, when you guys are working with your dogs at home, it's really important to keep those training sessions short. You could see that she started to just lose a little bit of enthusiasm. And that's when we wanna make sure that we're giving them a break because we only want rehearsal of the right kinds of repetition. We wanna make sure that she's enjoying the process. So. She might need to stay at this step for another week or so even. We want to make sure that the dog really feels confident putting pressure on that line before we start to worry about adding a verbal cue or even moving behind the dog. So ultimately, the goal of this behavior is to be able to be on your bike or if you're running can across, the dog is hooked up to you. Maple would then be out in front of you and you'd be able to give her a verbal cue. We say line out and the dog walks or runs to the end of the leash, puts pressure and then stays there. And so because Maple's just a little bit worried about putting pressure on the line, probably because we're in the garage and it's attached to the wall and she's like, what are we doing, right? It's, it's, it's a little weird, it's a little new for her. So I would have you keep practicing this until there's no hesitancy. When she's really confident and will walk to the end of that line and lean into it without getting worried, that's when we're gonna put it on cue. So because we're going to be working together through this, let me know when she is ready for that step and then we'll work on adding the cue. For you guys at home, we'll see if we can do another live like this to kind of walk you through that second step. But remember, whenever you're teaching a behavior, you have to get the behavior that you want before you attach a cue. So when we get Maple to the point where she confidently walks up, puts pressure on the lead and will stand there without being worried or hesitant, 
that's when we go, okay, awesome. That's what we want. Confident pulling into the line. Then we start to add the cue and you give the cue just before we get the behavior from her. So it's always cue, then behavior, and then we click and treat. So let's, cause we've given her a little bit of a break. Do you have a toy or anything for her down there? No, <laughs> that's all right. So why don't we hook her back up to the line? Let's see if we can get another couple reps with her now that we've kind of given her just a quick mental break on that. Is it okay if I throw the treat on the ground or would you prefer me lure? I'm, I'm totally happy with you tossing the treat because again, if you click and throw the treat backwards, then it, it sets her up for another repetition. Okay. But another, another thought, Hannah, is you could click and feed in position with her pulling Okay. And then click pulling a second time and toss the treat behind you. Okay. I'm wondering if I put my whole container of food down if she's in front won. of her. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely try that. I'm not opposed to that. I don't know if it was tricking or. And I see that a lot of you guys have tuned in and started watching with us. If you guys have questions um, while you're watching this process, you can post them in the comments and we will get to a little bit of Q&A at the end here. So feel free to ask some questions if, if, you, if you've got them. Really nice. So again, we're luring her out so that she feels uh, pressure on that line. We click the pressure, deliver a treat. And we're throwing that treat backwards behind her so that she releases the tension on the line and it sets us up for another repetition. Good girl, that was nice. Excellent. And this can be weird for some of you pet people. If you ever tethered your dogs, oftentimes we teach dogs when they're attached to something that they shouldn't pull, right? So that we can tie them at the park or tie them to a car while we're getting equipment and stuff. So remember, this could take a little bit of practice and it's a new skill for them. What we're looking for is confident leaning into that leash. Hannah, that looks really, really nice. Yeah, she's definitely more willing to lean now. Yeah, that's looking really nice. So you guys can, I don't know if you guys can see the difference, but initially in that first session that we did, she was a little bit worried about leaning into the line. Now you can really see that her weight is leaning forward and she's putting a lot more pressure on that leash. Really, really nice. Let's do one more repetition and then let's give her a break. There you go, good girl. Really nice. All right, Hannah, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna uh, drop you from the screen real quick and let you go grab a toy for her so that you can give her a quick break and play with her for a minute. Okay, I was gonna say, are we gonna use it for luring her to pull or? Nope, nope, okay. just to give her a mental break and let her play for a second. Okay, cool. Okay, so when you guys are working, you could see, it looks like you can see Georgia said, look at her go now. So that's, that's absolutely what we wanna see. And you could tell that we gave her a short break and after that quick break, she was able to then come back and perform even better. So that is looking a lot more like what we want from her before we put it on cue. Nice, confident, consistent quality of walking to the end of the lead and leaning into it. 
Um, so we want that nice, confident pull before we put it on cue. So honestly, I think that with that transformation we just saw, I think Maple would be ready to add a cue in another one or two sessions. Um, and again, our cue is line out. She walks to the end of the line. We click and treat. And after we get that skill on cue, then what we start to do is we start to put the human behind the dog instead of in front of the dog. But we need to start with that foundation of pulling into this line is something good for her. Okay. So with another few sessions, she'd be able to add that cue and maybe we'll give her a couple of days and then we can pop back in and, and see how her progress is. Um, so I'm going to bring Hannah back up here with us. All right. So Hannah, that was looking really, really nice. I would say let's give her another couple short mini sessions just like that. And then I think she'll be ready to add your cue. Okay. Um, so for now, let's make sure that we're continuing to lure her out to the line, click and treat the pressure on the leash. The other thing I want you to start to do in those little mini sessions of two to three minutes is reduce the lure. So let's see if we can start moving her out to the end of the line without having to use a, a big bowl of food in front of her. You know, let's minimize to a treat and then even from that point, let's minimize to maybe just a visual signal. This okay. is the exact hand motion you're doing with the lure, but now the food is only going to be in your treat bag and it only comes out after you click. Does okay. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and switch gears here from our line out practice and let's start working on um, teaching directions. So uh, we are going to teach G and Ha, and Hannah, I think you would like to use right and left. Is that yeah. correct? Okay, so it, it, guys, it doesn't matter what words you use as long as you're consistent. The only thing I would recommend to you is if you are planning on ever hooking your dog up with someone else's dogs, it's really helpful if all the dogs know the same cue. So for example, Hannah, if we hooked her up to Lennon and I'm, I'm telling Lennon G and Ha and she knows right and left, that would be confusing for her. But you're planning on running Maple alone majority of the time, so it won't be an issue for you. Okay, yeah. So um, we're gonna use some hand targets tonight to work on right and left. Do you mind stepping back real quick and just demonstrating what a hand target looks like? Yeah. <laughs> just like, uh... <laughs> and you can walk even further back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Anna, Anna. So a hand target, and yeah, yeah, really nice. A hand target is when the dog takes their nose and touches our hand. Uh, you can also use a target stick. So they do have um, tools specifically designed with, they're basically like a clicker that you hold with a stick and then a little ball at the end. You can also just use something like a spatula. Really, it just needs to be a stick with something at the end of it that that they can touch, or you can just use your hand. If you guys do not know how to teach a target uh, hand or you know a spatula or target stick, we do have some YouTube videos that are available for free on our channel that, that will demonstrate this for you. So we're gonna use these already existing targets to start to teach her the concept of right and left. There are lots of ways to do this and lots of ways we can progress with this. But what we're gonna start with is having Maple go underneath her legs, almost in that, that peekaboo trick, right? Where the dog kind of goes behind you, comes up between your legs. So Hannah, step back for me and practice a few just as a warm up of that. Yeah, really nice. You can see nice. So you can see that she's using that treat to guide Maple around behind her. And then when Maple gets in between her legs, that's when she's clicking and treating or using a verbal marker and delivering that treat. For some dogs, this can be a little worrisome as well. And it can be challenging if you have a bigger dog. Um, when I work with my largest Malamute, I have to almost stand up on my tiptoes just a hair. Um, but this is a really nice way to start teaching this skill because they're close enough where we can pay them and it starts to get them moving out and away from us. Really, really nice. So Hannah, we're gonna start with just a right direction turn. So okay. your, yep, so mm -hmm. your uh, right hand is going to be your target. Your clicker, if you're gonna use one, should be in your left hand. Your treat will be in your left hand. If you would like to just use a verbal marker, you're also welcome to do that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have her start 
in between your legs and the peekaboo, you're gonna present your hand target out and to the right, almost guiding her um, forward just a little bit and out to the right so that we're starting to teach that direction. And I want you to click her as she's turning versus when she touches your hand. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, so it's not actually a hand target, it's just it's hand, yep, we're having her follow that target. Click, yes, really nice. And then feed off to the right there, beautiful. And then as soon as she's finished, you can go ahead and ask her to come back between your legs and you can click and shoot that if you need to. Really nice. I'm gonna let you do a couple reps of that. I'm gonna make your screen big so people can just see you. Really nice, so she's already ready to add a cue. That, that looks really nice. So what you're gonna do, Hannah, you're gonna get her between your legs. You're gonna give your direction cue then, <laughs> then give that signal to, to get her to turn. Wait, wait, right. Nice. Right. Awesome, yeah. yep. Forgot to click. That's okay. Yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. So Hannah, because she's doing so well with this and she's almost starting to anticipate that turn, yeah. I want you to slowly minimize that visual signal. So okay. with each repetition where she successfully turns in the correct direction, the next repetition you'll move your hand just a little bit less. So that we're getting her to tune in on that verbal cue and she's not needing that visual prompt. Yeah. No, here. Right. Nice. Right. Yep. Right. Awesome. Good girl. Right. Yep. Really nice. So that time, guys, she paused just a moment. She gave that verbal cue, paused to say, hey, can you respond to it? She couldn't quite do it, so then she followed up with that visual assistance. Right, good. Fantastic, let's do one more like that and then give her a break. Right, oh, sorry. Awesome, really nice. Go ahead and give her a break. That was awesome, really, really nice. So each time you practice that, we wanna start you know, warm her up on the skill and then slowly minimize that visual signal so that she's truly responding to just that verbal cue. And when you're practicing directions, practice one at a time. So in that, that short little session that Hannah and Maple just did, we only practiced right. We did not practice both cues because we want her to be able to focus on just one skill at a time. And then you could give her a quick break, let her potty, go get some water, dice up some more treats, go outside for sniffs. And then that next session, you could then work on the other direction. So Hannah, did you grab a toy for her? Uh, yeah, she's not interested. She's only okay. interested. Okay, she says you got good treats out. I'm more interested in that. <laughs> yeah, she's trying to get them wherever I put them. <laughs> so let's go ahead. We're going to do the same concept, but mirror image. So now we're going to work on left. So now if you're using a clicker for a uh, left direction, your clicker will be in your right hand. Your treats will be in your right hand, or they'll stay in your treat bag until you click. Wait. Just wait. Nice. And Hannah, do me a favor. Take one or two steps to your right. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, you have to come under here. Wait. Ready? Yes. Really nice. So again, because this is a new direction, we're not using any verbal cues yet. We're just making sure that we can get her to follow that hand target around us and to the left. Good. Nice, good girl. Let's do one more and then we'll have you start using your verbal cue. 
Nice. So this next time, Hannah, you're going to start to add in left. Again, you get her underneath your leg centered, pause, say left, then give her that visual signal. Here. Now I'm not circling. Right here. Look. Look. Wait. Right. Yes. Nice. I can't do that with my left hand. <laughs> Coordination. It's the hardest part. <laughs> really nice. Well, you turn it around, but. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Oh, so close. Yeah. Ready? Left. There you go. Really nice. Good girl. And Hannah, what I'll have you do actually. When you're going to deliver that treat, let's see if you can transfer the treat from your right hand into your left and then pay her off to your left side. Okay, versus throwing. Yeah, well, just so that we keep her moving left, she's almost wanting to circle back around and look at you. Okay. Yeah, to do it again. Yep. Should I go back to luring? I would, yep, because we don't want that to become part of the behavior. So let's stop using our cue for just a moment and let's do, you know, maybe two or three reps where we're just luring her. Someone's running upstairs. <laughs> She's like, what is that? That's okay. Yeah. There we go. Let's give her a break for just a minute. Okay. So whenever you guys are in a training session with your dogs, if you're starting to see a behavior okay. that isn't quite what you wanted, it's it's easier for you if you're not doing it live with me to take a break for just a moment so that you can stop and reflect on that training session. I always recommend people propping up their, their phones and recording their training sessions because if you can see what's going on, it's gonna be a lot easier for you after the fact to go, ooh, I was doing this and it wasn't quite right or ooh, yeah, she's starting to add that, that weird spin in that I don't want. Um, it's always better the moment you see an issue to stop and, and reflect on that session. So what was happening is Maple was turning left and then wanting to spin back around to turn and look at Hannah. And, and that's not what we want, right? Because if you think about these behaviors that we're trying to get, their direction turns and the dog isn't going to be then turning around and looking back at us. That would be a problem. We want them moving forward. So that's why we had her almost go back to using a lure again so that she could keep Maple's nose turning around to the left side. Hi, what are you doing, Maple? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> okay, so let's give her just another minute of a break. Um, when you're practicing with her, Hannah, um, pick pick you know two to three minutes at a time. And location doesn't matter too much at this point, except for that we want low distraction environments. So working there in your garage, working up in your living room, let's try to keep it indoors and places where she has decent traction so that she's not slipping and sliding. Um, and practice one direction at a time. So either right or left. We want to avoid practicing them in the same session until she's really good at both of them solo, okay? So now your goal will be to pick one of the directions and then pick um, or, or then start reducing that visual signal. So when she was doing really well to the right and you said right and then paused for just a moment and she was predicting which direction she was going to turn. And so that starts to get that behavior on a nice verbal cue, which is what we ultimately need. We need her to be able to respond just on a verbal signal, not needing any visual assistance. Once she gets really good at both directions individually, then we can, we can do one of two things. We can either start to move the human behind the dog and have them move right around cones out in front of us, or we can start to combine them in the same session. So 
Hannah will obviously keep in touch. And when you're getting some nice direction turns from her with little to no visual prompting, we will we, we can do another one of these so that people can see what step two looks like for line out and for your directions, okay? Um, does that make sense? Do you have any questions about, about the direction training or, and your homework assignments? All right, uh, no, I don't, um, I think it's pretty, it's simple, but yeah. just getting her confident with pulling, I think will be the, the big yeah. thing. Yeah, um, the other thing, I wasn't really planning on doing this, but if you don't mind, I'd like to, I'd like to for just a moment, uh, work on a little bit of woe with her so that okay. you can get her to stop nicely on a verbal cue. Um, so if you don't mind, let's take that bungee off your pillar right. and you can, it doesn't matter where you hook it, you can hook it to her right. collar if she's wearing one or her harness, either is fine. Okay, but you want it off the pillar? Yes. So what the other uh, kind of basic signal that you're going to need for your dogs once you guys start doing this is a nice get up or let's go so that they know when to move forward. We also need them to stop. We also need them to slow down. So let's start with a little bit of um, woe with her. We're not going to use any kind of get up or let's go because we're indoors and it's going to be kind of low excitement. Mm -hmm. Let's just start working on woe. So what you're going to do, Hannah, is start moving in a direction with her. Let's say away from the screen to start. Take a couple steps, then say, whoa. Pause, you can stop motion. And whenever she stops motion, you're gonna click and pay in place. Okay. Okay. Whoa. And you can even make that whoa more dramatic like, whoa, because that's that's generally what we will say when we're trying to ease them down. Whoa. Really nice. Whoa. Awesome. Say that again. And then she plays off with my my body yeah, you know, if I yeah. Stop. so if you're noticing that she's really tuning in on that you can slowly walk so don't completely stop your motion okay. say whoa but keep yourself in just a little bit of motion whoa nice that was good whoa really nice good girl this might be our, this might be what's the hardest for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> it generally is. <laughs> so if you, um, she has a, a stand weight that I probably could get her to wait. Like, you know, we do it in motion for confirmation. Uh huh. Would that be applicable or do you think this should be a completely different cue? Great question. Um, you certainly could use it. What I would worry about, because I know how much work you've been putting into confirmation, I would worry that we would poison the cue and make it not as effective for you in confirmation. So generally when we are mushing, it's, it's kind of high arousal, high excitement, and stopping is really challenging for them. Um, when we talk to them in a manner we can talk to them in a, in a manner that encourages the right behavior. So if I'm out there and I'm like, hike, 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 that's really exciting. It sounds kind of harsh and that's going to get them up and moving. And then when we want them to slow down, it's easy. Whoa. We kind of draw out those words to help them slow down. Um, so I would recommend building a new word that is only used for um, mushing just so that we don't kind of undo or unravel any of that confirmation stuff. Okay. Yep. So, and, and when you're working on this, um, outside Hannah, mm -hmm. I would recommend practicing this when she's really excited, clip her to a leash. I don't care where the leash is say, let's go or hike, hike and start running with her. Click her when she starts sprinting. Okay. Stop and pay. 
And then as you're easing down, say, whoa, completely stop and pay her for standing. Okay. So we can teach those two cues together as a pair. Um, but I obviously, I don't want you running in the environment you're in because I don't want her sliding. Yes. Um, and I also want to make sure you guys have enough room to kind of sprint. So that would be something I would practice in the backyard. But you could tie that into your your whoa so that it's kind of a, a match there for you. Okay. So over the next week, I want you working on your line out. She's not quite ready for a verbal cue, but she almost is. So when you feel like four out of five repetitions, she's very confidently leaning into that line. Let me know. Send me a quick video so that and, and we'll kind of work on adding your cue. Um, for your directions, you can practice once or twice a day for two to three minutes at a time. In one session, pick one direction, either right or left. Um, and your, your goal with that is to work on reducing your visual assistance for her so that you're getting it on a verbal cue. And then aside from that, your third piece of homework is going to be your woe cue. And you can practice that either by itself at a walk, how you just did, or you can practice outside where you can start to sprint with her so that you can also work on a hike, hike cue with her. Okay, does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Any questions? No, I think of. I think you explained pretty much everything um, that I can think of. Okay. Um, <laughs> she's like, I'm done with this now, thank you. <laughs> Um, then what I'll go ahead and do, Hannah, is I will uh, minimize you from our, our screen here, and I'll go ahead and address some of these questions. You may want to mute it as well. I feel <laughs> and you're, you're welcome to go take her outside and potty and, and go on with the rest of your night. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. And let's address some of these questions here. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to post them. Um, Georgia says, was just going to suggest a toy might be a smart way to vary uh, breaks. Absolutely. So remember that when you're in a training session with your dog, we want to keep these sessions short. We don't want to work for 30 minutes straight. If you have a dog that really has a good work ethic, maybe a dog that's a little bit older, and you have 20 minutes to work or 15 minutes to work, I recommend breaking that big block of time into shorter sessions. So practice for two to three minutes and give them a quick play break or unclip the leash and let them go run around in your fenced backyard. Give them something to do for a couple minutes. And when you come back, you could see that that happened to Maple. She was starting to kind of go, oh, I don't know about this. She needed a break. And when she came back, she was not only back to where we left off with the pulling, but she was pulling even better. So remember to give your dogs breaks, whether they were planned or not. It, the moment you notice that maybe you're not getting the same quality of behavior from your dogs, that's when we need to go, okay, let's, let's take a break. Um, and toys are an excellent way that we can kind of break up that place or that training session. Um, let's see here. Great question. So we've got a question here from Yara. Do you find that dogs understand pull on this harness, but not other harnesses for loose leash walking? Awesome question. Absolutely. So I will tell you that my dogs have several different kinds of harnesses. Um, they have a harness for nose work uh, where they don't put pressure on it. They have a harness for loose leash walking in the neighborhood and it's loose leash. They have a harness for weight pull where they put a lot of pressure in that lead and they have a mushing harness. And th those are actually four separate harnesses that they have um, and they all mean a different thing. And so when you are working on the concept of loose leash for your general park strolls, neighborhood walks, I do recommend a different harness. We do not want our can across our bike joring, our dryland mushing harness to be the same harness that we use for loose leash walking in the neighborhood. So make sure that it's a different kind and that change of equipment can help your dog figure out, oh, okay, this is when I pull and get all excited and this one is calm. The other thing while we're on that topic, um, when you have, um, when you are starting to teach your dog how to put pressure on the lead and that it's okay and they start to really enjoy running and pulling, 
you might temporarily see a decrease in the quality of your loose leash walking. That's totally normal. Be patient with them. That's a really good time to bring your clicker and treats back out with you on your loose leash walks so that you can remind them this harness in this environment under these circumstances is loose leash. And that's where you get your reinforcement. And then reinforcement in the other harness comes from pulling. So they absolutely can understand the difference between different pieces of equipment and different environmental cues. Awesome, awesome question. Um, Okay, let's see here. Sarah Beth, what do we do if we've already done these things out of order? My dogs don't have a problem with the pulling part when we're running together. Um, so if you're still tuned in with us, Sarah Beth, maybe you can give me just a little bit more information. Um, if you've done things out of order, meaning that your dogs are already really good at pulling but don't know directions, if you could give me a little bit more um, clarification on that, that would be good. In terms of teaching things, in a specific order, I always want to teach foundations of everything before I hook the dog up to me. So before I'm connecting a dog, even can across, I make sure that they have a general understanding of what these direction cues mean. And for directions, we're talking about uh, whoa for stop. We're talking about easy for slow. We're talking about right and left or G and haw for our directions um, and line out. So I want to make sure that my dog understands each of those skills on their own in a low distraction environment before I then hook them up and ask them to do these behaviors. Um, so in terms of order, we definitely want to teach these skills in a low distraction environment. Then you can start to take them out on the road and practice out kind of in the real world. And I do that starting just with neighborhood walks. I won't hook them necessarily up to the bike or to me. I'm just teaching them, hey, when we go on a neighborhood walk, you're gonna get reinforcement um, for this. Okay, Sarah Beth clarified for me, awesome. So let me pop this up real quick. Um, she says, we go running with them regularly uh, and depend on the leash to, con con controls to communicate with them. So they don't have any directions or speed up, slow down verbal cues. So you've already got the pulling part down, which is awesome. Um, what I would recommend is two things. Separate your direction training from your current runs, because I know I've, I've seen you on social media, you've been getting back into running, which is awesome. Um, keep doing that. But until you've taught those skills, right, left, um, faster, slower, whatever word you want to use for those, teach those in a low distraction environment like your house, your backyard. Once eight out of 10 repetitions, they're on it, then start bringing those cues into your normal runs. So keep going on your normal runs, but avoid using those cues. Just kind of gently guide them with directions for now. And then once you've trained those cues, at home, in the backyard, then you can take them out on the road with you. Awesome. Um, oh, and another follow-up from her. Um, we're not very good with the leash controls when they see something exciting. Absolutely. So remember guys, whenever you're training a skill, there are several components. There's distance, distraction, and duration. And so when we are working on our dry land mushing cues, um, distraction is generally the biggest challenge that we face. Things like squirrels, things like other dogs, other people, and it can be challenging for them. Um, there are lots of ways that you can practice in a controlled setting your directional cues. So um, we'd be happy to help coach you through that with some environmental setups, but you know, we can set up a cone out in front of us and set up a distraction off to the left. We could even practice with our directions with cones out in the front yard on a long line so that we still have our dog attached for safety. But we could practice those di those directions when we're still very close to them, but there's external distractions. So there's lots of different ways that we can work on changing our controlled sessions to increase distraction level, which will help you when you are in that real world setting. Um, the one thing I would tell you is just make sure you're consistent and make sure you're compassionate because these distractions are really hard for them. And we wanna make sure that we're not, that we don't have unrealistic expectations, right? I wanna make sure that my dog really knows what these words mean before I get frustrated with them for not responding if there's a big distraction around. So 
because we just had this conversation about you and your directions, let's teach them in a low distraction environment. And then we can talk about some ways that we can increase the distraction still in a controlled setting to help build up their understanding of this cue so that even if a squirrel is dashing across the street or a deer is dashing across the path off to the left, you could still give a successful uh, G or right cue. All right. Um, Let's see here. I think this question popped up another one from Sarah Beth. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah Beth. Um, do you introduce the verbal cue at this time or just the hand target? So I think that this one popped up when we were doing our right and left. Um, people, generally speaking, try to add verbal cues too quickly. We always want to make sure that we have the behavior that we want. And this, this includes um success right i want to make sure that four out of five repetitions i can easily get my dog in the correct direction before i start to add that verbal cue and and really what we're doing is transferring that cue because we're using a hand signal a follow to get our dog to do it so what you're going to do is give your verbal signal of g or right then give that visual signal and then click and treat the response and as soon as we start adding that verbal signal, we wanna to start to reduce the visual prompting or the visual signal so that we can get this on a really nice um, verbal cue. Because again, ultimately our dogs are gonna be out in front of us and they're not gonna see any kind of visual signals from us. So we really do need to make sure that when we're training this, we have nice clean mechanics so that we are getting it truly on a verbal cue. All right, got one more question here from Jennifer. Any suggestions on when, age-wise, it's okay to begin can across bite drawing, ski drawing, et cetera? I have a 10-month-old female Malamute puppy who weighs about 70 pounds. I just ordered an X-back harness for can across, awesome, and hope to bike draw. So, um, great question. So whenever we are working on kind of high impact exercises, so this could be things like agility training, this could be some trick training, um, or certainly things like dry land mushing, we want to make sure those growth plates are closed. So I am not putting a Malamute, especially because they're bigger dogs. Um, I don't want to put them into a position where they're exerting a lot of force and putting a lot of pressure on those joints before the growth plates are closed because it can cause some soft tissue, some bone damage and create problems later on like early arthritis. So we want to make sure growth plates are closed before we kind of get into super high intensity activities. However, you can absolutely be getting her trained on all the cues. You can get her on some can across walks or can across hikes so that she gets used to the concept of being out in front and pulling. Um, you can also get her used to the bike. So have um, the bike moving around her to make sure she's not worried about the bike. So there are all kinds of really important foundation things that you could get started on now. And then I would say slowly start working in a little bit of more fitness to help get her fitness and endurance levels up a little bit. Um, but I would want to make sure that those growth plates are closed before we're doing, you know, five miles bike drawing. Um, so that'll be around a year and a half to two years of age. If you got her from a breeder, you could certainly reach out to your breeder and see kind of when her dogs, maybe the parents of the dogs fully matured, because that'll give you an idea as to when those growth plates are closed. And you can always go to your veterinarian and do x-rays and they can tell you if growth plates are closed as well. So what I would say is, I'm so glad that you're getting in, getting into this for a Malamute, especially it's gonna be a really nice breed specific thing for you to do. Mine certainly love it. Um, but let's start with some really nice foundation skills teach her real all the cues she's going to need to learn, make sure they're really nice and strong, and then start working on some can across uh, skills for her. And then before you know it, you're going to have a really, really nice dry land mushing partner. Looks like we've got another question here. Do you have any suggestions for protecting paws? Awesome question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in general, we want to train on a variety of surfaces so that our dog's feet kind of slowly build up a little bit of endurance. Um, I personally 
choose to run my dogs on soft terrain. So I'm really focusing on trails and grass and dirt and sand just because it's easier on the bones. You know, I know when I go running on asphalt, it hurts my body a lot more than if I'm doing a trail run. And the same thing for our dogs. Um, if you're running on abrasive surfaces, maybe like stones, or you notice that your dog's feet are getting worn down, you could definitely get some booties um, and teach your dog how to wear those. Um, companies like Howling Dog Alaska have some nice booties that you can purchase, different kind of intensity levels for protection. Uh, there's also a product called Musher's Secret, which is kind of a wax substance that you put on the bottom of their feet, and that can be used to protect them against, um, you know, snowballing if, if you're riding on snow. Um, but in general, I, I certainly keep an eye on my dog's feet, and I will check them after every run that we do, and I always have those things with me. But in general, I like I like for my dog's feet to build up a little bit um, so that I don't have to worry long term about, you know, any damage to their, their feet. Um, let's see here. Any tips on starting two dogs together, especially if one is faster than the other? Ooh, good question. So whenever you're hooking multiple dogs up together, you always want to make sure that each dog on their own is confident and comfortable with the sport. Um, you wanna make sure that they both know their directions. If you have one that is really, really strong and confident, that can kind of be your lead dog and it can kind of help teach your other dogs some skills. But we definitely don't wanna uh, hook up two total newbies together because that could be a little bit dangerous. Um, when I'm starting with two dogs together, I definitely look at it as more of a training experience. So I wanna make sure that my runs are nice and short. I wanna make sure that everybody is successful. Um, I, I wanna avoid frustration or heavy corrections, really corrections at all, because I don't want my dogs to feel uh, upset. I don't want them to be worried about the activity. So I always keep things short, sweet, and very positive. And that will help build that drive for them. And then I would recommend like I said, teaching, um, making sure you teach each dog the skills they're going to need. And then in terms of one being faster than the other, if that's the case, you're always going to have to teach the faster dog to run at the pace of the slower dog. Because if your slower dog can only run a certain speed, we can't ask them for more. Um, sometimes if you hook dogs up staggered, so I'm going to kind of use my hands, let's pretend this is the faster dog and this is your slower dog. You can hook them up like this and that way the slower dog is excited to kind of chase the dog in front. And sometimes that can help increase speed a little bit. Um, but you might have to work with your faster dog on some easy cues to get them to slow down so that you can verbally control what speeds they're running at. All right, awesome. So it looks like those are all the questions that we have popped up at the moment. I hope that that was helpful for you guys. This is definitely the very basics of teaching these skills from scratch. There are so many more ways that we're gonna develop these behaviors and really get them nice and strong. Um, if you guys need help, I'm happy to do some virtual coaching with you to teach these directions, start getting your dogs out in front of you. So any kind of troubleshooting that you might need, I'm happy to assist. Um, you know, one thing with this social distancing we're doing now is a lot more virtual stuff. So it doesn't matter where in the world you are, we'd be happy to help. Um, and oh, we've got one more, one more question that popped up. Let me get to this real quick. Uh, what is the best way to integrate pups into the team? So this is similar to my recommendations for, um, running two dogs together, we want to make sure that the younger dogs or the newer dogs know a little bit of directions. Um, if, if you have a team that's already pretty successful and, and knows all the cues, that team can certainly help you train the more inexperienced one. But I always recommend taking some time solo to focus on that newer or more inexperienced dog because we really want to make sure that they know what they're doing and that they're not just kind of aimlessly following along because that could end up causing you some problems down the road. So what I would say again is similar, kind of take it slow and easy, do lots of short and sweet runs with lots of reinforcement, make it fun. And depending on how many dogs you're talking about hooking up, um, play around with your connections because you might find that different dogs thrive in different areas of your team. So we would wanna make sure 
um, that that each dog is kind of in the most successful position. And then really keep an eye on speeds we want to make sure that everybody in the team is successful. So if you've got a faster dog, we're going to have to ask that dog to slow down a little bit. And then keep an eye on frustration levels, because if one dog is always having to hustle to hurry up and one dog is always slowing down, that could certainly cause some stresses. So you might consider kind of rearranging who you run together and not always running all, all of them together. Um, I personally have three dogs. Two of my dogs match up really, really well. Um, very similar drive, very similar speed. And so it's it's magical to kind of hook them up together because they really, really fit well. Um, my older guy does not run at the same speed as the younger two. And so I have to be very, very mindful when I run all three of them together because I don't want my older guy disliking it. I want to make sure he's always having a good time. So we do shorter runs when he's hooked up um, and slower speeds. And that way he can still enjoy that nice team run, but it's definitely at the 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 pace of your least experienced or least qualified dog. All right, so I hope that that was helpful, everybody. Um, we'll continue kind of monitoring this for the next 24 hours or so, so that if you guys have questions and are catching on after the fact, we'll try to get some of those questions answered for you. Um, certainly lots of ways that you can progress from this to teach your dogs how to be out in front and really get nice directional cues from them. And it's totally doable, even if you only have one dog. So that was something that when I was first starting off, I there wasn't a lot of information on how to do this with positive reinforcement. And a lot of the recommendations were hook them up to a team that's qualified. And I didn't have that ability. So we worked through this and, and we figured it out. So there are certainly ways you can do it no matter how many dogs you have and what their experiences experience levels are. So quick tips, keep your session short two to three minutes at a time, giving them lots of breaks in between to kind of keep them um, mentally game and mentally wanting more. If you start noticing in your training session, oh, that is not what I want. And I've gotten it twice in a row. Take a break because we don't want them rehearsing the wrong behavior. And usually if my dog's messing up, that's a good indicator to me that I'm probably doing something wrong or that I could be doing something better. Prop your phone up and hit record because you can then go back at that video footage and go, what the heck am I doing with my right hand, right? A lot of the times body parts move and you have no idea they're moving. So by hitting record, you, you're then able to go back and watch that session, which is super helpful in making sure that you're making it really clear for your dogs. So I hope that this was helpful for you guys. I hope that you are gonna separate some time from your schedules and work on a little bit of uh, directions with your dogs, a little bit of line out, teaching them how to do this skill. If you guys have questions, please feel free to let me know. And hopefully in a week or so after Hannah's done some work, we could maybe do another live with her and her pup Maple so that we can show you guys kind of the next step of this. All right, guys, thank you all for joining me this evening. I hope you have a lovely night. Bye.